hear me? Is this on? Is this on? Can you hear me? Oh, higher up. Better? Okay. Um, that is not the right side. Um, okay. So I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me a chance to talk here today. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge all the people who worked on this project. I think you'll get a sense when I go into it that I couldn't have done all of this alone. So many people contributed to this. What we'd like to do is for all of the resources that go into fault-tolerant quantum computing. And in particular, we'd like to examine the overhead costs that you incur when you incorporate fault tolerance. And I'm going to show that that's uh, pretty substantial. And from that, we'd like to uh, kind of determine the implications that this has for hardware. Um, what types of hardware should we be picking? What types of design decisions should we be making when we're uh, sort of choosing directions for future research? So I'll give you a preview for my talk. This is a diagram that shows operations inside of a quantum computer, or more specifically, a fault-tolerant quantum computer. In the lower left, we begin with a spin state rotation. And all the way up here, we have an arbitrary logical quantum gate. And in between, these are steps that make fault tolerance, error correction, et cetera. And I've obscured the details from you all. But on the x-axis, you can see the time scales for these operations. And these time scales actually move on a logarithmic axis. And so you can see that we go from picoseconds up to milliseconds. That's what this talk is going to be about. So to organize our fault-tolerant quantum computer, we developed a layered architecture. So the lowest layer of the architecture is the physical layer. And in the physical layer, you have just the physical quantum processes, qubits, gates, and measurement. And I'll go into these in more detail, so this is just the abstract. Above the physical layer is the virtual layer. The virtual layer is where you start to actually shape physical processes into information primitives. This is where you have dynamical decoupling that creates a better, more coherent memory. You also have compensation sequences that counteract gate errors. You might have deco decoherence-free subspaces. This is all where you might be called passive error correction. Um, this is not measurement. So in other words, open loop, I think, is uh, what Robert Crotzett often likes to refer to it as. Um, above that, we actually have active quantum error correction. In this example, we're considering surface codes, but you could also insert your favorite error correction, bacon short, et cetera. Um, so in this layer, you have circuits for the code, and also the syndrome processing, which, uh, as you might see in Alston's talk, is not trivial, Alston Power. But finally, the outputs of quantum error correction are not complete. We only have a fault-tolerant set of resources, but what we need to uh, turn that into is a logical substrate for quantum computing. And there's some more steps, actually some important steps to go through. We need to create uh, a universal set of gates. So in, in the case of the surface code, we need to distill special and silly states that allow us to create these universal gates. And we also have to, in some cases, create uh, arbitrary quantum gates, and there's several ways of doing that. But finally, above all of that, we have the application layer. And this is where we execute quantum algorithms. Um, two algorithms I'll analyze today are factoring, hopefully more complicated than this, and uh, quantum simulation. In particular, I'm going to look at simulating chemistry. So the physical layer is populated with uh, the usual suspects. Uh, you have a physical qubit. In our case, we're looking at self-assembled quantum dots, indium arsenide dots. They're controlled with laser pulses, uh, stimulated Raman transitions. And we also are proposing to use optical measurement. But in addition to that, what we also care about are what are the engineering parameters of these processes? Coherence time, gate execution time, and what types of errors are we seeing? Are they systematic or random? Because the next layer up is going to use the outputs of the physical layer, the virtual layer 
needs to shape physical processes into information primitives. So dynamical decoupling actually operates on the physical layer to create uh, coherent qubits. In this case, I've just shown uh, a simple decoupling sequence uh, that will extend our, D, our T2 time. But then we might embed this decoupling sequence in a BB1 compensation sequence to also get good virtual quantum gates. Uh, a reason we might do this is to cancel out laser intensity fluctuations. So what we can do is we can start building up that diagram I showed you at the beginning of the talk. We now have the first two layers of the architecture. We have, and I've filled in some of what those, um, those operations are as well. The spin state rotation and measurement and entangling operation from this architecture are at the lowest level, and they're relatively fast. But building on, we now have some of the virtual operations, and they take a little bit longer because they're built of sequences. And so necessarily, they're slower. We also have decoherence here, which is um, out in the microsecond range um, based on experiments in quantum dots. So moving beyond that, we have the quantum error correction layer. So this is a slightly tilted uh, set of tiles from the surface code. And from that, you can create or you can just you know, extend what is the circuit for doing surface code quantum error correction. That shows you how to extract the syndrome. In the syndrome, you can do syndrome matching. This is how you do the error correction process itself. But it also shows you how to account for the resources. What are the gates that make up the surface code? That's important to know when you're developing an architecture. And then you can count the gates to see how many gates are required to do error correction steps. But we're also interested in estimating how big is the code? How large of a code do we need for a particular problem? For the surface code, there's been some uh, good simulation work that shows that we can model this reasonably well with these um, power law fits. And so what you can do if you have a particular algorithm in mind with a particular logical error rate, so I'll go ahead and define some of these terms. The threshold is a threshold of the code. In this case, it's been shown to be about 0.9%. Epsilon sub v is the error rate coming out of the virtual layer. Remember, virtual layer is just below error correction layer, so all of the virtual layer operations feed in to the quantum error correction layer. C is just a, a constant that basically is just for fitting. Um, epsilon sub L is the logical error rate. This is the error rate we need for the algorithm. So I've chosen here 10 to the minus 15, which is something typical for shores and probably also representative for simulation algorithms, depending on your parameters. Um, but when you look at this and you say, OK, for these sets of parameters, I need a diff 29. That allows us to start making estimates about how large of a surface code we need for this particular problem. So from that, we can start to fill in the next layer of the architecture. What are the time scales that we need to do error correction? Just one step of error correction, for example. So moving up from the virtual layer operations, how long does it take to do a lattice refresh? Well, that's built on several layers of virtual gates. It, we saw the circuit diagram one just before this. And then if we want to do defect braiding to do logical gates, like C naught, that's built of several lattice refreshes. And also this little red arrow here shows that, uh, importantly, the lattice refresh, which detects errors, that's where you get your syndrome, needs to be somewhat, rather, probably two or three orders of magnitude faster than decoherence. You have to detect errors faster than they occur. That's just a simple fact. So the quantum error will provide you with error-corrected resources, but that's not everything that you need for quantum computing. What comes out of that is just um, high fidelity, um, actually not quite Clifford gates, but almost Clifford gates. You're missing one, the S gate. Um, but you need to actually make a full set, uh, the universal set of gates. And so to do that, you have to inject states into the code. Those states are uh, noisy, so they have to be distilled. So that's process is shown here on the left. You inject faulty ancillas and distill them. But even after that, you just have a finite discrete set of gates. And from that, you can approximate arbitrary gates. And there's at least two good ways of doing this that I know about. Um, methods that uh, do not involve additional ancillas. I'm not talking about the uh, state distillation ancillas. I'm talking about down here. There's also a method, uh, sometimes known as phase, that involves a special multi-qubit ancilla state. 
used for uh, approximating arbitrary quantum gates. And I'll just touch on this briefly because it impacts our resource analysis. So as I said, we need to do state installation because we need a universal, uh, a universal set of gates for quantum computing. So this is the T gate, the gate we need to make a full set of gates. There we go. Um, and so we need to create this state. We're going to use it in this measurement circuit. You've probably seen this many times before. But what I want to emphasize is we need very many of these gates. You'll, you'll get a sense of how many in a few slides when I start looking at these algorithms. But it's on the order of billions, trillions, or quadrillions. You need a lot. Um, you also need them at very high fidelity. And so what that means is that quantum computers are going to require factories to produce this. In other words, you're not going to make them one at a time. You're going to have large sections of the machine devoted to pumping them out. It's kind of like uh, cash on current CPUs. They take up a large section of your chip if you're familiar with how circuits or how processes are laid out. So this, for example, is heuristically what a factory might look like. This is concatenated distillation circuits. You actually see a distillation circuit, and this is, you know, if I could fit more, you would put more here. Outputs of one distillation circuit feeds into another one. And we might do this because you need to get very high fidelity. And so how do the resources for state distillation scale? Well, they actually scale kind of well, but you should still be mindful of that. The error suppression is doubly exponential. Well, that's pretty good. Uh, that means that the, the leading order error goes like something 3 to the level of distillation, p to the 3 to the level of distillation. So it goes first level p cubed, then p9, then p27. So that's suppressing at a very high rate. But the resources do climb up uh, exponentially as well. So I'm looking here at circuit volume. Circuit volume is. If I was drawing a rectangle, one side would be the number of qubits I'm using, and the other side would be the number of gates. So this is qubits times gates. And the reason that I look at it this way is because, because of, there's a lot of opportunities to stretch circuits or squeeze them in different ways just by parallelism. Sometimes you can do things in parallel to make the circuit shorter. Sometimes you can stretch it out. Um, because we're doing this factory style, you're looking at doing very many of them in parallel. Um, there are limits to that. Obviously, there is a minimum circuit, de minimum circuit depth you have to be mindful of. But anyway, this is just going to feed into our resource analysis. I have plots that will make this a little more visual in a little while. Arbitrary quantum gates are also really important. They don't play such a big role in Shor's algorithm. So if that's what you care about, not such a big deal. But they are very important for simulation. And I'll show that in a, uh, at the slides at the end of my talk two ways that I know about to do arbitrary quantum gates. The first way is probably the better known of the two, which is gate sequence methods. You just take a sequence of gates, so H, T, H, T, H, S, whatever. Um, these are just gates that are available to us from uh, either error correction or from the injected ancillas that we distilled. And we use these to approximate an arbitrary unitary. The most Probably the oldest and most famous example is the Soloveitchikov algorithm, but I'm going to show you that's not the best way to do it. But uh, in addition, there's also a method known as phase kickback, and this cool way to do it, although uh, it's not necessarily the best in all contexts. In this case, there's a special ancilla state, and what you do is you use a controlled addition circuit, kind of a weird idea, but when you do that, this controlled addition circuit actually doesn't change the ancilla it puts a phase on the circuit, on the qubit that was the control. That's why it's called kick back. It kicks back a phase. Um, I don't have time to go through all the details unless you want to talk about it after the talk, but it's a neat idea. Um, and because it has adder circuits, there's different opportunities for how you set up the um, operation. So gate sequence methods. You start with or rather, you just set up a sequence of gates. So it's only a single qubit. They go in a line like this. So for example, what I've drawn here just approximates this phase gate. And the idea, when you're setting up these sequence methods, that longer sequences will produce better approximations. So the, 
in a sense, when you're designing an algorithm, you will say, I need a certain level of precision <coughs> from my gates. And if I need higher precision, that's going to come at a cost of higher circuit depth, higher resources. In particular, it may also come, or it will certainly come at a cost of higher T-gates. We've seen that these T-gates are expensive. So here are the three methods that I know about for doing uh, arbitrary uh, quantum gates. solovey kataev gate sequence method, and the circuit depth scales polylogarithmically. The power here is something like between three and four. Um, Fowler's method, uh, there was a reference on a previous slide, uh, is also a gate sequence method. And so the sequences look just like the sequences from solovey kataev they're just more compact, and the way they're determined is different. That is, the classical algorithm for determining them. Um, and then phase kickback is completely different from the two. It uses a multi-qubit ancilla, and it uses adder circuits. And because it uses adder circuits, the circuit depth and circuit resources depend on those adders. So ripple carry circuits are simpler uh, and have higher depth. Carry look ahead, uh, this is terminology from you know, arithmetic circuits. but. They're more complicated, but they can be faster. Um, I guess I don't have time now, but the, the classical computing time varies also, which can be an important consideration. So what I want to impress upon you is solovey kataev even though it's probably the, the best known method for making arbitrary gates, and again, arbitrary gates are necessary and important to simulation algorithms. So if you need simulation algorithms, you need arbitrary gates. solovey kataev scales really badly and I don't see a good reason to use it. <coughs> Instead, you should use one of these other two, either Fowler's method or phase kickback. There are different scenarios where one might be better than the other. I don't see where solid kataev is better. This plot shows uh, there's a distance metric here, which is basically the error in the gate. On the left axis is circuit depth, and it's on a log axis. So you can just see that these two uh, are scaling, you know, this is tens of gates, hundreds of gates, and solovey kataev just blows up. So we'll just move on. We won't consider that one anymore. Um, here's looking at just phase kickback and Fowler's method in more detail. It looks like Fowler's method is the better of the two. In both circuit depth, now on linear scale, and T gates, it's lower. Um, it turns out that that's u that is definitely true if you're only making simple uh, single qubit unitary gates. However, there are some more complicated scenarios where phase kickback can be advantageous that I don't have time to go into, but if you're curious, come ask me. So now we can set up our diagram. This is the diagram all the way up to layer four, which is what we saw at the beginning of the talk. We can go through all of the steps from the physical layer up to the logical layer. What does it take to create fault tolerance up to this arbitrary gate that we need? And so we can see that all of the steps in between, especially going to error correction and going to logical state pre or logical gate preparation, there's some big jumps here. In particular, going from the bottom to the top is about six orders of magnitude. So I'll quickly go through some results here. Shor's algorithm, uh, there's some assumptions that led to these results, uh, if you're curious, but how fast can you do it on this model? So the bottom trace is, well, if you could run the circuit as fast as possible, that's what you would get. So in bits to factor, that number is uh, 1,024, 2,048. These are typical problem sizes we consider interesting. They're beyond what we think is possible classically. The blue trace corresponds directly to circuit depth. And if you could run your circuit as fast as possible, this is also execution time in days. But to make this problem more interesting, we also looked at what if the size of the quantum computer was fixed? So it's only 100,000 logical qubits. That's what leads to the green trace. The green trace shows you that perhaps we cannot, uh, or we cannot distill those states we need, the T gates, as fast as possible. The size of our machine is not large enough. This is why I was talking about those factories are going to take up the, a bulk of our quantum computer. When I say the bulk, I mean 90%. 90% of the quantum computer needs to be devoted to distillation or the algorithm will stall. Shor's algorithm will stall. So what's happening here? In this case, only 75% was distillation. It doesn't run as fast as possible. So let's look at quantum simulation. In this case, this is first quantized simulation. 
The x-axis here is number of particles. So this could be electron or nuclei. Uh, again, circuit depth on the left, execution time in days on the right. And here's some example problems. So lithium hydride, propane, alanine's an amino acid. Um, and so in this case, we actually are using face kickback. Details, come talk to me, or in particular, go see a poster by James, James Whitfield. Um, and you can actually run an interesting simulation problem on the order of a few days. <coughs> and so the last uh, result slide I'll show you is uh, we also want to look at second quantized simulation. So what if we're doing uh, lithium hydride? We had to focus on a specific model because second quantized doesn't, you can't look at you know, a wide range of parameters as easily. Uh, in a single lithium hydride energy eigenvalue simulation using the STO3G. Now I'm showing the impact of the choice of phase gates. So phase kickback and Fowler's method are down here. They take, I guess this is on a scale of about, um, you know, five to eight days. And Salovac and Taya just, it's unreasonable. Um, so I realize I'm about to use up all my time and I should conclude. Um, the layered architecture we've introduced is a promising approach for the design of fault-tolerant computers, but in particular, the overhead costs associated with fault tolerance separate the operation times between the logical layer and the, the physical layer by four to six orders of magnitude. And if you're curious, we have a paper on the archive, layered architecture for quantum computing, and the simulation results are in preparation. Thank you. Thanks very much, Cody. Other questions? Robot. Thank you. Uh, I, I have a question uh, about one of your very early slides. Okay. You give a formula for the residual error uh, after error correction in a surface code. Yes. And it goes like basic error rate epsilon to the power of d over 1, d plus 1 over 2, where d is the size of the system, I believe? Um, d is the distance of the code. D is the distance of the code, yeah, exactly. So, uh, so uh, on Monday, I think, uh, uh, we had a talk uh, about a surface code uh, and, and, and by Andrew Cross, and it was mentioned that it looks like from his simulations that it's not minimum weight errors that dominant uh, the residual error uh, after error correction. So there are longer length error chains which are individually suppressed by powers of epsilon, but th they have a combinatorial factor that's, that's more important. So based on, on, on that comment in that talk, I would think, um, I, would s I would expect a different power up there. A, a, co a correction factor, because what you seem to be saying it is that the the errors that dominate the threshold are are, are the shortest possible ones. So, they do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I do. Um, first of all, this is based on simulation results. Uh, second of all, we're assuming I didn't have time to go into this, but we're assuming that you are substantially below threshold, at least in order of magnitude, and I believe. If I understood correctly, uh, Andrew's work was closer to threshold. Um, and so that's where you would probably see higher weight errors having a higher impact. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's it. That as you go to in the limit, um, epsilon sub v going to zero, the dominant errors are going to be the shortest error chains. Thanks. That's another question. Mark. So, so I'm very happy to see your accounting of, of all the resources here. But uh, if you go back to your sort of your your your, your layered hierarchy, there is a you know you, you you talked at the very beginning about the uh, the control costs, if you like, where uh, the physical layer going from the physical to the virtual layer, and you talked about having dynamic decoupling pulse CB, uh, I and so forth, right? And uh, what I didn't see was how you actually factored 
the, those costs into, the, into your overhead as well? The cost of um, dynamically your, coupling? Yes. Um, well, they, they are incorporated here. For example, as you can see, uh, the one cubic gate at the virtual layer is substantially longer than the one cubic gate, if you will, at the physical layer. Um, I didn't have a lot of time to go into the details. Um, You're counting the time. It's not actually counting the off cost there. Counting the off cost. I'm sorry, I don't guess I don't fully understand what you're asking me. They, I mean, this is <coughs> about a factor of 100 longer, and it has in part to do with the fact that there's, I don't know, 20 operations there, but also the fact that they're separated in time deliberately. Okay, I hope this answers your question, Mark. Okay, good. Uh, I think at the interest of time, we rather would like to thank all the speakers of the session. Thanks again. I will reconvene then at 11 o'clock.